Straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. A jury awards compensatory damages to the parents of a victim of the Sandy Hook school shooting. As InfoWars host, Alex Jones is ordered to pay out millions of dollars. Plus, could U.S.-Russia trade talks be back on to get WNBA basketball player Brittany Griner back home following her shocking sentencing? And following a years-long court battle, actor Kevin Spacey is ordered to pay up to compensate the makers of Netflix series House of Cards. And later... This is where 17 people died. This is where 17 people were injured. And it looks and feels like a place where that many people were hurt. Jurors, attorneys, and reporters toured the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School building untouched four years later after the Parkland Massacre. Law & Crime Daily, covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everybody to the Law & Crime Daily. I am your host, Imran Ansari. The Sandy Hook defamation civil trial against conspiracy theorist Alex Jones entered its second phase on Friday to determine punitive damages in the case. This comes just a day after the jury ordered the InfoWars host must pay more than $4 million to the parents of a first grader who died in the shooting. Neil Heslin and Scarlett Lewis filed the lawsuit against Jones after the 2012 Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting in which 26 first graders and faculty members lost their lives. The lawsuit stems from comments Jones made after the incident where he told his InfoWars audience that the shooting was a hoax orchestrated by gun control advocates. He later admitted believing the shooting did happen and even testified at the trial that it was real, but argued he had a right to say that it wasn't. Judges in Texas and Connecticut ruled Jones was liable in the civil cases after he failed to comply with discovery demands and ignored several court orders. Heslin and Lewis sought $150 million in damages for their injury to their reputations, mental anguish, and emotional distress. Following two weeks of testimony, jurors came to an amount of $4.1 million in compensatory damages. On Friday, the case entered its second phase as Heslin and Lewis seek punitive damages. Attorneys once again presented opening statements, and only one witness testified. Then both sides presented closing arguments. The plaintiff's attorney told the jury Jones made his money off of lies and that he even lied while on the stand. I mean, when's it going to be over with from that side? What they've attempted to do inside this courtroom with the facts presented to them versus what they say in response is a mockery. If they're willing to do it here under oath, they're definitely not stopping it outside when he's in his studio with his microphone in front of him. The evidence that we have in this case is that at a minimum, Alex Jones is an incredibly wealthy man. And he has made it based on peddling lies and fears. I don't know why so many people like the man. I don't. Jones' defense attorney presented his closing, telling the jury his client isn't to blame for what the plaintiffs have gone through. Let's talk about why Mr. Heslin and Ms. Lewis are so upset. They are upset because someone convinced them that one out of four Americans wants to hurt them. Did Alex Jones do that? It's crazy. Did Alex Jones do that? No. He ran with a story he shouldn't have about an issue of national importance. The plaintiffs didn't hear about it till years later. At our trial, and he has apologized, and he apologized on that stand repeatedly. Okay, joining me today is law and crime analyst Matt Mangino and criminal defense attorney Karen Felicia Nance. Matt, I want to go to you first. Neil and Scarlett were seeking $150 million in damages, well above what was ultimately awarded, which was $4.1 million. Was that enough? And what can we see now that we are in the punitive damages phase? 
Well, I think it was enough uh, because what it clearly uh, shows is that this jury felt that, you know, truth is important and that telling lies uh, in the public, over the airwaves, telling lies in the courtroom uh, just uh, doesn't cut it. Uh, you know, it's difficult in a case like this to really put numbers up on the board in terms of damages. Uh, you know, they came up with a novel approach, you know, a dollar for uh, a quarter of the people, uh, you know, who, who, who uh, heard about this or, or, you know, because they said one in four people, uh, you know, believed it. Uh, so I think $4.1 million is, is a, a real show uh, that they think that uh, Alex Jones is responsible for this. And now we get into the punitive stage. And, and this, this is where they're going to decide whether or not Alex Jones should be punished. You know, okay, this was just about lie. This was just about damages, what damages they caused. Now the question is, should they be punished? Or should Alex Jones be punished for his reckless conduct in, in, in calling this uh, terrible disaster, this tragedy, a hoax? Yeah, and Karen, you know, Jones's trouble, legal trouble, is not over. There's other lawsuits out there. Some are delayed by bankruptcy filings. What do you expect to see in those other trials? Does Alex Jones have a, a chance in those trials? Well, I think that I would see just a copy of what's, what's happened so far in this case. I mean, he didn't uh, make an appearance every court date. I think that that did have an impact on the jury. And then when the uh, victim's father, uh, the, the plaintiff in this case, testified, he made derogatory comments about his testimony, the, the father's testimony on the witness stand. He seems to be a, a defendant out of control, that the attorneys are unable to keep him under control. And I think that that's not going to change moving forward. Yeah, great analysis, guys. And in Florida, a woman is sentenced on the one and only charge she was convicted of after being acquitted of murder. Daniel Redlick was found not guilty of second-degree murder in the 2019 stabbing death of her husband, Michael Redlick, last month. She was found guilty of tampering with evidence, as investigators say she cleaned up blood and moved her husband's body. Redlick claimed she killed him in self-defense. 911 calls real Redlick initially told dispatchers that Michael stabbed himself and had a heart attack. Investigators say she waited several hours before calling for help the night of his death. Danielle was back in court Friday. The judge ultimately decided she will not have to spend any more time in jail, and she was sentenced to one year probation. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, actor Kevin Spacey is ordered to pay millions to the makers of the hit Netflix show, House of Cards. But first, after American basketball player Brittany Griner is sentenced, the Kremlin responds to possible U.S.-Russia trade talks to bring her home. Welcome back. Russia says it's open to talking about a possible prisoner exchange involving WNBA player Brittany Griner. This comes a day after a Russian court ordered a shocking nine-year sentence over drug charges. Griner was detained at the Moscow airport back in February with vape cartridges containing cannabis oil packed in her suitcase. Last month, Griner pled guilty to the charges but argued she did not intend to bring an illegal substance into the country. Under Russian law, the trial continued despite the guilty plea, in which Griner took the stand in her own defense. She argued cannabis is used in the U.S. to treat pain, and that she accidentally packed it without thinking. During the sentencing Thursday, the judge said she found Griner intentionally broke the law, sentencing her to nine years in prison and ordering her to pay a $16,000 fine. The U.S. has offered a swap to get Griner and another American back from Russia in a trade for Russian arms trader Victor Bout, a man previously convicted of conspiracy to kill U.S. citizens and providing aid to a terrorist organization. Let's bring in my guests. Karen, the sentence for this charge seems outrageous. Do you think that they went almost for the maximum here? Do you think that was excessive? I believe from, according to U.S. standards, of course it's, it's excessive. I think that it's part of the deal. It's part of the political process in this particular instance to try and broker a deal with her and, and Mr. Wheelan versus the one that's uh, in custody in the Russian that's in custody in, in the United States. So I think that that was the purpose and they wouldn't give a lesser sentence. The prosecution was asking for 9.5 uh, years and she got 
uh, 60. I'm sorry, I'm, she got the uh, nine years. So I think that it's part of the deal, the political deal that's being brokered at this time. Right. Matt, Victor Bout was convicted for a much serious charge than Griner. Uh, do you think that a prisoner exchange like this could set a dangerous precedent and possibly lead to other Americans abroad being detained for political purposes? No, I don't think it's a dangerous precedent. I mean, this has been going on for years. When I hear about this trade, I think of the uh, snowy board, Russian border uh, exchange uh, 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 prisoners. Uh, you know, so this isn't this isn't anything new. This kind of diplomacy has gone on for years and years and years, and I don't expect that it's going to be uh, a problem. Great analysis, guys. Uh, also in celebrity news, authorities are waiting for a full investigative material into shooting on the set of Alec Baldwin's Western movie, Rust, to determine if any criminal charges will be filed. In a social media post this week, the district attorney for the Santa Fe area said prosecutors are awaiting forensic analysis on the firearm before a decision can be made. She says her office has only received portions of that investigation from the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office. This all stems from Baldwin shooting a revolver during a rehearsal on set in October of last year. A live round of ammunition killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins and wounded the film's director, Joel Souza. Baldwin told investigators and said in interviews that the gun just went off and that he did not know it was loaded with live ammunition. Investigators released hours of body cam footage and clips of the film from when the shooting happened. They've also described neglected safety measures and disorganization in the making of the low-budget film. So far, no one has been criminally charged. And coming up on the Law & Crime Daily, disgraced Oscar winner Kevin Spacey is facing a major payout as he's ordered to pay millions over a show's loss of revenue. Plus, the Parkland school shooting. The state winds down its case against the gunman who pled guilty to killing 17 classmates and faculty in the Florida school massacre. Welcome back. Kevin Spacey is ordered to pay millions of dollars to the makers of the Netflix show House of Cards over lost revenue. After a years-long court battle, a Los Angeles judge ruled Thursday Spacey and his production companies must pay the producers $31 million after the actor was fired in 2017 for alleged sexual harassment of crew members. It was found that Spacey violated his contract over conduct during each of the five seasons of House of Cards he starred in and executive produced. Spacey was fired amid production of the sixth season, which had to halt filming, rewrite the show to remove Spacey's character, and shorten the season to meet deadlines. The production reportedly lost tens of millions of dollars. The ruling comes after years of allegations against the Oscar winner, which brought his career to, in, to a halt in 2017 amid the Me Too movement. Spacey faces a separate lawsuit from actor Anthony Rapp, which is expected to go to trial in October. The actor is also accused of sexual assault in London. He is set to go to trial over those allegations next year. Okay, Matt, it seems like Spacey is getting allegations, lawsuits from every angle. Do you think he could ever recover from these things professionally and after these legal issues? Well, you know, professionally, it seems to be the least of his worries right now. Um, as you've indicated, uh, because of the morality clause in his he violated, you know, he owes $31 million. He faces what appears to be criminal charges in London for sexual assault and another lawsuit. Um, you know, he, he needs to get his life in order. Uh, and I don't know if that's possible to ever uh, have a chance to get anything, to salvage anything of his professional career. Yeah, Karen, this is a large judgment against Spacey. He faces those other lawsuits. What happens if he just can't pay these judgments? Well, I think that uh, the court would look at what other assets that he does have. He might not have it in cash, uh, but he does have it, I'm sure, in, in property he owns. So I don't think at this point that that's going to be an issue. Obviously, it's dependent on what the, the verdict's going to be if there is a verdict against him. So I think that that's uh, a secondary issue, but it's clearly an important issue because these victims want to be compensated, especially after uh, a case is heard, just like in the case we just had, uh, where the judge made a finding of the $31 million. So I think that um, there is an, a possibility he might declare bankruptcy, but the court would deal with that accordingly as well. 
Yeah, great analysis there. When we come back, the Parkland school shooting trial. The state rests its case as jurors tore the untouched halls of the Florida building where the shooting happened. Welcome back. Jurors in the Parkland school shooter penalty phase trial see the destruction firsthand as they visit the school where more than a dozen students and faculty were killed four years ago. The state rested its case against the Parkland school shooter Thursday, but not before jurors were able to see the school building where the shooting happened in person. On February 14, 2018, 17 students and faculty members were shot and killed at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. The gunman, a 19-year-old at the time, pleaded guilty to 17 counts of murder and 17 separate counts of attempted murder in October. Now nestled inside a 15-foot chain-link chain fence, this 1,200 building of the high school grounds has sat untouched for the last four years. The damage from the shooting is seen even outside as broken windows are spattered with bullet holes. All 22 members of the jury, 12 jurors and 10 alternates, rode in vans from the courthouse and toward the outside and inside of the school building. Prosecutors, defense attorneys, and the judge accompanied them, following the same path that the shooter took through the building. Several members of the media were also allowed inside, but only to observe, not to film or take pictures. They say the classrooms sit exactly as they were after the shooting, with textbooks and Valentine's bears strewn across desks and dried pools of blood on the walls and floors of the hallways and classrooms. This was a very difficult scene to walk through. It was uh, disturbing on a number of levels. I mean, what we saw was the end result of children who were in the middle of an average day having a really wonderful time, and all of a sudden, a nightmare uh, erupts right in front of them. Um, one of the most difficult things to look at uh, in addition to the blood in the hallways and, and in the classrooms is just the knowledge that these people were having a, a, a beautiful day and, and everything is kind of frozen um, where it happens. Laptops are left open, um, assignments are just sitting there never to be looked at again. This is where 17 people died. This is where seven pe 17 people were injured and it looks and feels like a place where that many people were hurt. After jurors returned from the school building walkthrough, prosecutors ended their case with several more victim impact statements from the families of those who were killed, which included the wife and son of athletic director and wrestling coach Chris Hickson, who lost his life while saving the lives of students. His loss has left us broken. We have a void in our lives that will never be filled. He was an extraordinary man living an ordinary life. And everybody who was lucky enough to have a relationship with him is better because of it. Mr. Hickson, was your father, is your father Mr. Christopher Hickson? Yeah. And is there something that you'd like to tell the jury about your dad? Yeah. What is that? It's okay. It's okay. Okay. Is there something about donuts that you want to tell us? What was your favorite thing to do with that? Yeah. Tell us. You can tell us. We, it was Saturday we ran to Denny Donuts and walked back. <laughs> okay. A real tragedy. Karen, the shooter has reacted to the videos and the testimonies with different emotions throughout the trial. You think the jury is paying much attention to how he acts in the courtroom? Absolutely. This is his life on the line. He's either going to spend the rest of his life incarcerated or he's going to be sentenced to death. So I think that every time we testify, uh, the, the cameras are focusing on him, but I, especially the jury's looking at how he's 
he reacting? Is he showing any remorse? Is he showing some signs of, um, you know, that he should be redeemed, that his life should be saved? And I think that all eyes are on him, uh, not only the public, but the jury as well. And Matt, the jury has now seen the building, giving more visual context to the testimony, videos and pictures they've seen during the course of the trial. Will this help the jury decide if he is given the death penalty or life in prison? Well, no question. It, this is going to be impactful uh, on this jury. It really, it's unprecedented uh, that a crime scene uh, could be kept and preserved for over four years uh, and that a, a jury could go into that crime scene, essentially, and, and observe exactly what was happening uh, or, or what happened on that uh, particular day. Oftentimes, juries go to crime scenes, but they don't go to crime scenes that are preserved. You know, this is really unique. And, and I think it's going to help the jury put some context. And, you know, you see photographs, you see videotape, you hear about measurements, but this is going to provide context. They went and saw exactly where this horrific crime was committed. Yeah, Karen and Matt, thank you. Great analysis. And thank you for joining us here on the Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.